welcome to episode 14 of the Graham Cochran Show, where I'm here to help you build your online business, work less, and live and give more to the things and people you care about. I'm your host, Graham Cochran. Honored to have some time with you today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, I want to talk about some stupid stuff that I've done. I want to share three mistakes I made when I launched my very first online course all the way back in 2010. So I'm going to break down the three big mistakes, share a little story of how that first course kind of came to be and how it launched. Um, And in doing so, hopefully steer you to a little more clarity when you're launching your first course or your next course. So I don't know where you are in your journey. I don't know if you're really at the beginning You've never even built an online course. You're just like, what is this? I I was talking to a buddy at church uh, yesterday who's been listening to the podcast, and you know he wants to start a business, and he hasn't figured out what his idea is, and so he's not quite there yet, but he's listening. He's just chewing on it. He's getting all the information. He's diving in, and uh, when he finds the right idea, lands on the right idea, he's going to be able to execute, and today's episode is going to really, really help him out because he's going to know what not to do with his online course, and more importantly, I'll show him and you, what to do. But maybe you've already launched an online course. You know, you might have been doing the online business thing um, part-time, full-time for a while, and maybe you're new to me and my method and the way I like to teach, and maybe you're lurking and maybe you're trying to figure out a way to make more revenue. You know, I've done launches that, uh, as I'll share today, made a couple hundred bucks, you know, and I've done launches that have made a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, so it just, I've done a lot of things better (laughs) in recent years, but I had no clue, no clue what I was doing when I started. And that's why I wanted to do this episode. So this will be really, really helpful for you. If you're thinking about launching an online course for the first or millionth time, and you want to do it better. So let's go back in time, the year's 2010. And I've just started to put out videos on YouTube. I started blogging back in 2009, October of 2009. So I had been writing articles and then I decided I needed to start shooting some videos to teach the content I wanted to teach. Um, I couldn't do it all in written form. So I added videos to the arsenal and I uploaded, I think my first YouTube video, I started the channel like in January of 2010. So I'm uploading content weekly, uh, three times a week, two articles, one video. And if you haven't already checked out episode, uh, what number is it? Let me go back. Let me go back. It's nine, I think. Yes. Which comes first, your product, your content? I'll give you the, the short answer. It's your content. I was putting out content first and just learning my audience, learning my niche, learning what I felt like I could bring to the table. So a couple months in to video content, so now I'm five or six months into content in general, I'm thinking about, all right, how do I monetize this thing? So I didn't even know context for you. I didn't even know that this was a model to have free content on your blog or your podcast or your YouTube channel, and then build an online video course. Didn't even know that was like a way to monetize. Everyone was telling me to do ads and sponsorships. And that just seemed like messy to me. I didn't want ads all over my website. And I tried some sponsored ads for a while and I, I didn't have ads on my videos for the longest time. And I, I just thought it was just dumb. So I was looking for a better way to monetize. And the idea struck me that, man, I could really go deep on a subject, like real deep on a subject, but that would take like 20 or 30 YouTube videos. What if I just filmed it all, zipped it into a zip file, created a PayPal link and uh, let people buy it? That was my goal. And that was about as far as my strategy was for beginning to work on my first online course. My first ever online course at the time was called Pro Tools Bootcamp. Pro Tools is the most widely used software in recording studios. If you've seen any documentary of your favorite artist or band in the studio and there's a producer or an engineer at the the console and there's a computer screen with like colors on it, nine times out of 10, you're looking at Pro Tools. It's like Photoshop, right? but it's for the audio people. It's the program that everybody knows. Now there's other programs other than Photoshop, just like there's plenty of other programs other than Pro Tools, but it was and still is the largest used piece of software. It's the one that I use and uh, it's confusing to people. Um, 
And what's worse is I was looking around and I was seeing that the other courses and trainings and books and magazines even that were teaching how to use this software called Pro Tools were just awful. They were awful because they were very academic and boring. And it's like, guys, we're making music here. This is an art form. This is creative. There should be nothing academic or boring about this. And just because we need to learn how to use a tool, that's what was turning people off. They're like, I want to just make music. I've got the idea in my head, uh, but the software on the computer is like the bottleneck. That's where I'm getting hung up. So um, I felt there was a need there to make a better product in that space because I knew the software inside and out. I'd been using it since college and I, I could do it in my sleep. It was not confusing to me. And I was already teaching my real friends in real life. That's a little clue for you. I was teaching my real friends in real life how to use Pro Tools, the software. So I figured, hey, I'll just make a course on it. Um, and I launched it as called Pro, Pro Tools Bootcamp. <clears throat> and um, you know, the thought was that like, hey, it's gonna just get you up to speed crash course on how to use this software. Fun side note, turns out that um, I almost infringed on a trademark. Uh, there's a guy who later became a friend of mine. I've actually done um, live speaking with him and we partnered together. Um, and he has a trademark called Recording Bootcamp. And he reached out to me saying, hey, I know we're in the same space. I think you're doing some great stuff, but your name kind of is closely infringing on my trademark. Um, and anyway, I was like literally a couple months into my existence, uh, I realized I was already infringing on somebody's trademark. So I was scared out of my mind, but he was really cool. And we became friends. I renamed it to Rethink Pro Tools. You may not care about the subject of that course or the name of it, but the point is, this is where I was at when I launched. Now, here are the three mistakes I made. I had this idea, I'll make this course these videos, I didn't even call it a course. I didn't even know what a course was. But I was like, I could just make some videos that are like YouTube, but longer and better and sell it. That's That was my strategy. So mistake number one, and just a preview here, before we dive in, stick with me to the end, because at the very end of this episode, I wanna give you a really, really helpful resource on building online courses. And I'll tell you how to get that at the end of the episode, so hang tight. Um, mistake number one, was I did absolutely zero research before I built this thing. What I did was just built what I felt was safe. So I told you as a half truth that I knew that there was a gap in the product, uh, in the market really, for teaching this software. And it was boring, academic, and I thought I could teach it better and make it more friendly, more conversational, more approachable. And that was half true. The other half to the reason why I launched this course as my first course was because it was the safe thing for me to do. I looked at my level of perceived expertise at the time, and I didn't feel confident enough to launch any kind of paid product on recording or mixing or any of the actual things that I was teaching for free on YouTube. The only thing I felt confident that I could take people's money, and it was like I knew this software like the back of my hand. And so I was insecure. People wanted more content on the how, not as much the software, uh, but I, I didn't feel confident enough to, to ask people for money to teach them that stuff. Maybe you can relate. So what I ended up doing was, well, I literally said, this is the only product I'll ever build. And hopefully this makes me a ton of money because I don't know what else to build. I felt like I could confidently teach you how to get started using this software called Pro Tools. Uh, and I didn't have a problem taking money, tell, teaching you how to do that because I've been doing it to people, for people. Um, I worked at a software company and taught my whole department, the audio department, how to use Pro Tools better because they didn't know how to use Pro Tools. I'd put presentations together. I learned it in school. For whatever reason, that felt safe to me. So insecurity is a real big problem when it comes to building something that you're going to sell because a lot of times, and I see this, where entrepreneurs, budding online business owners want to sell something that they just feel totally safe or they don't feel icky taking somebody's money. And it's really because that they're insecure that it's, it's what's called imposter syndrome where you start to say to yourself, who am I to sell a course teaching XYZ? Who am I to ask people for money to show them how to do ABC. 
that's where I was. So I just did what was safe. Um, and I didn't build what people truly wanted. Now, granted, I wasn't wrong. People did and still do want to learn how to use this software, um, but it wasn't what they really wanted most in general, and it wasn't what they really wanted most from me. The silver lining in this was that uh, I basically scratched my own itch. You know, I, I would have wanted a course that taught Pro Tools in a certain way, and so it kind of worked. And that's a little bonus for you too, is if you scratch your own itch and if you're selling to people who are like you, uh, it can work. It just doesn't mean it'll work the best. And to be fair, that course, it launched at maybe $45 and now it sells for $89. <clears throat> so, and it's changed throughout the years um, and been updated a bit. So whatever the average price was over the course of these nine, nine and a half years that I've been selling this thing, it sold over a quarter million dollars, just that one little course alone. So definitely not my biggest seller, but just goes to show that even your first flop of a course, if it's okay, can over time make you a boatload of money uh, if you stick with it. So the mistake was I just built it and I just sold it. Um, The way you want to build a course is to research. A couple episodes ago, uh, I shared with you three steps to writing better sales copy. And step one of that was to understand and then articulate back to people their external and internal problems. This involves a lot of research. And this is what a lot of online business owners don't want to do or don't want to hear. They, they just want to, they want to hear that it's really simple. You just make a digital product, put it out there in the world and uh, sell it. And then what they want is to learn some marketing trick or Facebook ad trick to sell more of it. <clears throat> the problem is they've, they've built a house on sand. They, had only, they don't even have a firm foundation. The foundation is building a product based off of real research so that you know this is something people actually are clamoring for. It makes selling and marketing so much easier. Even if you run ads, it makes all of it so much easier. But people don't want to hear it, and they certainly don't do it. I certainly didn't do it. So what you want to do is take the time to research your audience. As you're building content and you're looking at the 30 posts you put up or the 50 podcast episodes or the 100 videos you've done on YouTube, whatever it is, what are the top 20% of your content? You know, So if you've done 10 videos, what are the top two in terms of engagement, views, comments, likes, shares, right? It's going to be easy to figure out what are the top two of your 10, let's say. And that's going to give you a huge clue as to what topics are your most popular. And then of those two, which is the most popular? Um, and from there, you'd probably want to do more research of what about this topic or what specifically in this topic or what what comprehensively could you do in this topic um, that would make a desirable product. I didn't do any of that. I just built something and sold it. Now, there is a lot to be said about not overthinking things. And I don't know where you are in the spectrum. You could be, I typically overthink things in life, just ask my wife, and that can be harmful. And sometimes I just need to go and do. My wife is the opposite. She she just goes and does. And sometimes to a detriment. She sometimes needs to, needs to pause and have more strategy, more planning. And I think that's why God brought us together because he knew our personalities could complement each other. I learn a lot from my wife's just don't think about it, just do it um, personality, even in business. And I, I, I love it. She'll figure it out and adjust as she goes. And I could learn a lot from her. But she could learn a lot from me too about <clears throat> planning and researching and, and, and connecting the dots ahead of time so that you only do the strategic work. So if you put us together, we'd be like the most perfect business owner, which is, a, that sounds really arrogant to say, but we'd be like a super mega awesome business owner if I could just like get rid of the bad stuff in my personality and just get her good stuff and vice versa. Point is, I don't know where you are on the spectrum, but sometimes just launching something, making a product, throwing it out there is good, but it's not gonna likely sell very much. I would rather you spend just a little bit more time, even if it's just one extra week one extra week of doing some research, combing through your content, your free content, doing that 80-20 analysis, what are the top 20% of my posts and pieces of content, and then analyze within that what is the top 20% of those, 
what's that one thing that I really should make my first course on or my next course on? And then asking good questions to your audience on social over that week about that topic and what are your the three biggest things you want to learn about in this topic. I mean, there's so much we could talk about in researching for building that product. Um, that will go a long way before you ever even film anything, build anything, market anything. So mistake number one, I did no research. Don't make that mistake. Mistake number two, I had no launch strategy. Technically, the lack of strategy is a strategy, but it wasn't strategic. Okay, It was just god-awful. Let me tell you a little story about how my first product launch went. Um, filmed this course in my, my spare bedroom, just whatever I wanted to make. Again, no research. Um, zipped it up. Put it up on my website. Um, built a little sales page using iWeb. Do you remember iWeb? It was that free website building software that came on your Mac. No, nobody remembers that. Uh, I remember it. If you remember it, then just... Air high five. Knew nothing about websites, so it's just, you know, drag and drop. Here's a little template. Knew nothing about sales copy. Um, basically, just wrote up a little thing and said, hey, here's what this course is. I listed all the features, like none of the benefits. I did everything. Like if you just go back and, and listen to um, episode 11 uh, about writing better sales copy, you'll know exactly what I'm talking. I did none of those things. I just put up a sales page. Here's the thing. Here's the price. Here are all the features. Here's how many hours of content it is. Buy it. Okay. That was my sales page. Zipped up the files in a zip file. I had no, I didn't have Kajabi. I didn't have any backend that they could log into and stream the videos. It was just like a, a monstrous download. And I had so many people, short story, in other countries. I have over, I have people in over 220 countries that follow my, my content. Um, and so, when you realize you have a global audience, you realize that internet speeds all over the world are not the same. Okay, that sounds very um, obvious, but as a, as an ignorant American, I had no clue that not everybody uh, that was following my content, even on YouTube, so aka they had an internet connection, otherwise how would they know about me? I didn't realize how, what the disparity of internet speeds were. I got friends even in London. Even in London, a big city like London, they can't lay fiber optic cable or do anything with because the infrastructure is just not there because of these old, old buildings with all sorts of regulations on construction around them to preserve them for historical sake. So the, the internet there is still kind of like 4G, like bouncing off of, you know, towers. It's, it's not near, and there's so many things blocking the signal that it's just not fast, even in modern day London. So anyway, point being, people would complain all the time, like, bro, is there any way to break up this download? It's like a two gig download. It's taking me forever. I was like, ah, oh, so sorry. And this was 10 years ago, mind you. So it was a nightmare. Anyway, did nothing right. But here's how the launch went. Put everything up on the internet. Wrote the sales page, like I said. And uh, I wrote one or two emails. I had an email list. Thank the Lord. I had an email list to sell it to. And um, I sent out the emails. And it said, hey, announcing Pro Tools Bootcamp. Check it out. At the time, my grandfather, who lived in Seattle, he died. And so the funeral was out in Seattle. And at the time, I was living here in Florida, as I still do. And uh, so I had to just drop everything, um, fly out there, meet my my mom and my dad. My brother met me out there and went to the funeral. So my grandmother, um, she lives in a uh, retirement home that is a condo in downtown Seattle. It's pretty ballin', by the way. So it's a sweet place. She's got a view of the Space Needle off her balcony. Um, but we're staying with her, and uh, she didn't have internet in her her apartment, or she had it on her one computer. It wasn't working. So I knew that there was Wi-Fi down in the cafe or the library at the bottom of the building. So after the funeral, I said, hey, I'm just going to take my laptop, go down, and check some email um, for my business. And, uh, I'm going through email customer, not customers, excuse me, student questions and feedback. And I get this email. It says, you've got payment. It's from PayPal. You've got payment. And I'm thinking, who, who's paying me money? Because at the time, all I sold was my mixing services. I was freelance recording and mixing bands. And so 
Um, I, this was, I didn't have a product for sale yet at the time. I didn't have a true online business other than a freelance business. And I didn't have a client at the time. So it's like, is this somebody's late payment? Is, some, is this like a deposit on a gig that's coming up that I don't remember? That's, this is how not strategic my launch was. I, I had no idea. I wasn't even expecting anybody to buy anything. I'd forgotten that I'd emailed out my course. I'd just been caught up in the, uh, the funeral and, and seeing family and flying across the country. So I'm sitting 3,000 miles away and all of a sudden somebody put $45 in my account. And uh, I will never forget that day. By the way, I, I have a picture of the, the little library area where I was sitting because that was where I made my first dollar online. It's a very important moment for me. But this is how pathetic my launch was as I was so confused as to why is somebody giving me money? Oh, because I launched that Pro Tools course. Yeah, pathetic. So I had no strategy. No strategy. I still made a couple of bucks. Let me give you some tips on how to launch more strategically. I want to give you three things. There's a lot of things that go into launching well. I talk about all of this in my course, Automatic Income Academy, in, at length, okay? But if you had to boil it down into three bullets of what you need to do to launch way more strategically than Graham of circa 2010, here's the three things you need to do. One is you need pre-launch buildup. I had no buildup. All I did was secretly build this course, and then all of a sudden one day I email my list, hey, here's a course, it's for sale. Okay, that's fine technically because now they know about it, but think about if movie theaters and movie studios did this. Think about if you had no idea that the new Avengers movie was coming out or when it was coming out or that it was even being made, and all of a sudden it just, Show, there's a billboard that shows up. Avengers Endgame is in theaters right now. You'd be like, what? Is, did you hear that? Avengers Endgame is out? Is it really? Like, nobody would be there in the theater that first day or that first weekend because they didn't know about it. They weren't excited about it. So much of helping a movie like Avengers or Star Wars or any movie, any movie, so much of getting people to the box office is hype. What do they do? They launch movie trailers well in advance sometimes a year in advance with a teaser trailer, right? To get people excited. Oh, it's coming out in December, right? Like there's so much anticipation with trailers, uh, with promotions on food products at the grocery store. All the actors and actresses are doing the late night talk show circuits, right? They're being interviewed in magazines. It's all pre-launch hype and buildup. And you need to do the same thing for your products. You need to start to tease out to your list and to your audience that you're working on this specific thing and it's coming out soon. It's going to be amazing. And you start to tease out some of the content. You start to tell people why they should be excited about this thing when it comes out. You should tease out some of the benefits that it's going to offer them when they purchase it. So in a way, you're kind of starting to drip out your sales copy weeks in advance. I think the longest I've done pre-launch buildup is a month in advance for a course. Um, but I didn't do any of that the first time. So hint that something is awesome and it's coming uh, and you can get really specific. You can even tell them what it is and when it's coming. Um, like literally uh, as I'm recording this right now, today we're actually dropping a trailer, speaking of trailers, for a new course that comes out in four weeks, five weeks actually. Um, and so that's the very first real hint for my audience that this thing's coming. We tell them exactly when it's coming and exactly what it is. So uh, it's not even a hint. They know it's coming. So we're treating it almost like a movie trailer. So launch buildup is huge. Number two, when you launch, don't do what I did in 2010, where I just sent one or two emails and I was like, here you go. You want a launch week. It can be four or five days. It could be seven, eight, nine, 10 days. But typically I like a five-day window five to seven days. But in a five-day window, like if you launched, opened on a, on a Monday um, and you're launching all week long, uh, you want five emails minimum. One each day at the launch, minimum. Uh, this is where a lot of people go wrong. They, they don't want to bug their list, which when they say that, that bugs me. I'm like, why else have a list if you're not going to sell to them? That's the whole point of a list. You're not bugging them. You're telling them about some amazing life changing thing that's going to make their life better. That's not bugging them. If it bugs them, which it inevitably will bug some people, they can unsubscribe and leave. And they should because they're freeloaders. Or, and that's not fair, 
they're either freeloaders, meaning they just want your free stuff and they're irritated when you sell something, which is a small, small percentage. A lot of my students think that that's a larger percentage than it is. It's a small percentage of people that are truly irritated when you sell. Most people totally understand and they're actually excited about the product. Um, but the other people that want to unsubscribe are the people who no longer need your content. I've unsubscribed. I've unsubscribed from friends of mine. Dude, they're awesome. I'm not a freeloader. I just... I no longer need to learn that or I'm not at a place where I can apply that right now. So I just unsubscribe. So you're not going to bug people. It's your, it's your duty to let everybody know that your thing's coming out. Just like it's the movie studio's duty. It's like Marvel Studios or Disney or Paramount Pictures or whoever's putting out a movie is their diligence and their duty to put out every piece of information they can to every audience they can that their movie's coming out. Otherwise, how can they expect to to make records at the box office or make their shareholders happy or make enough money to pay off all the expenses of the movie. They spend $200 million on a movie. They need to make at least $200 million back plus all the marketing spend. So it's their job. They're in business to let everybody know. It's the same thing with you. So when you launch five emails minimum, you need to talk to your list every single day during launch week. And then number three um, for launching strategically is you need some sort of scarcity element. I've talked about this before on my YouTube channel, um, but whether you're closing the course, so this is their only chance to join, it's going to close on Friday or close on Monday or whenever you close it, um, or the price is going to go up after this launch week. So if you want it at this price, it's going to double or it's going to go up by 50%. You might as well get it now. Or there's a bonus, a, an amazing irresistible bonus that you're offering during launch week that if you buy during launch week, you get this bonus. If you wait till next week, you don't get the bonus. So you might as well buy now. You need some element of scarcity or urgency, depending on how you use the word, to convince them if they're on the fence and like, oh, this looks awesome. Most people, they're just going to come back and check it out later, which means they're never going to buy it. Even if they intend to, they're going to get busy and distracted. So it's your job to give them a reason to buy now. And I didn't do that at all with my first course. I just sent out an email or two, no launch buildup. And it was like, it's for sale. You can get it whenever you want. Consequently, I didn't sell very many products or copies of that product. It wasn't until I started to add urgency, uh, have more buildup when I would relaunch this course or re-promote this course that I started to get more sales on this little initial course. So launch strategically, don't do what I did. And then um, the third and final mistake that I made with this first launch was that I didn't follow up with my students. The way I treated it was I built this thing. I created a sales page that explains what it is and who it's for. And so if you want it, you're going to buy it. And once you bought it, you just watch the videos and you're good to go. There's two mistakes in that assumption. One is I assumed that my course was self-explanatory enough that people could get the most out of it. Granted, it's simple. I think it's eight videos and you just watch them in order. They're labeled one through eight and with this topic as well. Um, you just watch them and you learn a lot. But the, the hidden assumption there is wrong because people to get the most out of your course need to be guided a little bit. And so they need to be told, even if it's obvious, hey, watch the videos in order from one to eight. And video one will explain the lay of the land and what it looks like and what all the buttons are. I'll give you a tour so you'll feel more comfortable looking at the screen. See what I'm, I'm explaining the benefit of watching video one. So I'm almost even selling my content to the people that have bought it. Does that make sense? And then I explain maybe what to do first, second, third, fourth. Give them a path. Don't assume that it's obvious to them. Even if it is obvious to them, you're reinforcing the simplicity of it that, hey, this has been organized for you. Go from here first, second, third, fourth. And by the time you get to here, you will know X, Y, and Z. You're, you're just bringing in your sales copy and massaging it even deeper down into your actual purchasers so that once they open up the course, because they've just spent money, they need to be reassured they've made a good decision because they're going to get that buyer's remorse. Like, ah, was this worth spending the 50 bucks or the 100 bucks or 200 bucks? When you show up with a welcome video or a welcome PDF, um, with or welcome series of emails, or these are great, having a, a series of emails that are pre-written that go out to new customers 
that sort of walk them through the course, help tell them how to get the most out of it. All that stuff is really good. It helps them get the most out of the course and they're going to feel confident and they're going to feel excited because they don't feel like they're alone because they are alone. It's asynchronous, right? It's not like they're in a class with you and other students at the same time. All your students are taking this course whenever they want, wherever they want. So they physically are alone. Uh, so they need a little bit of that sense that you're there and you're just guiding them, okay? That's that's one thing that happens when you follow up with students is, is you you give them a, like a, a plan. The second thing I, I didn't do when I didn't follow up was I didn't follow up a week or two or four or six after that initial wave of students purchased the course to see, hey, how did things go? What was your largest takeaway? What kind of results have you gotten so far? Right, those all those things show that you care, give you fodder for good testimonials, hopefully. But then also, how could I improve the course? What would you have liked to have seen that would have made your experience even better so I can update it later? Because you have lifetime access to it and I'm gonna update it later, right? Especially if you use a tool like Kajabi to sell your courses where it's not a stupid zip file like I had. Um, once they purchase, they have a login to a course that's living and breathing. So if I update it in my Kajabi backend, let's say, uh, then all the videos update for everybody. You never have to like resend a download. So, but that's neither here nor there for me 10 years ago. Um, but the point is, this shows that you care. You get a lot of information for testimonials. Um, but you learn what the holes are in your course. And when you know what the holes are, you can fill them which makes your current customers happier. Uh, and then it's gonna help you better sell to new people because now you can know people really wanted to see this and I didn't quite cover that in detail. So that it's more research. It goes back to the initial mistake I made, not researching. You're still researching after people have bought it. Isn't that interesting? You're researching the, the buyers even. A lot of people, and I'm, again, this is one of my mistakes I did for many years. I'm in this camp. A lot of online business owners, once they make the sale, they move on to find fresh meat. And I, I, I say that somewhat sarcastically, but you know what I mean? They made the sale. I got you as a customer. I got your money. You got the course. I'm going to move on and find new people. That's a huge disservice. The people that have bought from you are the most valuable because they've spent money with you. They've done business with you. So to honor and respect them and to help yourself out, you should constantly engage with your buyer's list, the people that have bought from you, find out what they thought of the product or products, what else they want help with, what are they struggling with right now, what could you do to make their lives better. It's research from the most targeted, perfect group of people because they've already bought something from you. So their opinion probably is going to be more helpful to you than even the people who just follow you, you know, on social or ingest your free content or even just the people on your email list who haven't bought. So not following up with my students was the third mistake and it was a huge one because I missed a huge opportunity to learn how to make the product better, but also how to make better products that they could also buy down the road. So I would suggest for you to have a follow-up email sequence or at least a welcome video or a welcome document that sort of gives them a tour of the course, shows them what to do first, second, and third, and gives them some simple action steps. And it gives them that guide that they need and reinforces that they made a really smart decision. And then two, follow up with, after a launch, follow up in three weeks, follow up in a month, follow up in six weeks. You know, one way you could simply over-deliver is you could email the people that purchased during your, your launch or promotion and say, hey, I want to offer you a free group coaching call because you joined, just wanted to over deliver. And so um, here's where, when we're going to do it. Here's how we're going to do it on Zoom or we're going to do it on YouTube Live or something. It's a private link. Come join if you can uh, and ask me whatever question you want on the subject, on the course, whatever. And I just want to coach you. This is an over deliver for them because now they get live access to you. Um, you do it once because you can batch it. You can have 100 people on at once or 200 people on at once or seven people on at once. Um, so it's value add for them. Two, for you, it's going to be research. It's going to be customer research, one hour of your time, 90 minutes of your time to learn a ton about the people that just bought from you, but how you can make their experience with your product better and make better products in the future. And then it, you can record this through Zoom or through YouTube Live or whatever. It'll be a recording that you can then upload into your product backend in a hidden page just for them or for everybody so that even if they couldn't come, they can watch the recording and 
get more free content from you, which is awesome. So don't make that mistake either. Okay, so circling back, in 2010, I just slapped some videos together, called it a product, launched it to my list of like 500 people, and maybe I made 100 bucks that week or 200 bucks, okay? Pretty pathetic, but maybe you've been there. We all start somewhere. It's okay. I made some money, and that was a win for me when I had no money and I was on food stamps. And it, what it did was it was proof of concept for me that, hey, I can make content for free, build an email list, and then film a course that goes more in depth and has more value and sell it to that list. Now, how can I do this better? And that's what I've been on a, a mission to do for the last decade is do that, but better and to more people. And now I do it in two different brands and two different niches with two different businesses. So the three mistakes I made was I didn't research at all. I just built what I wanted to build. That's classic entrepreneur mistake. It can sometimes work out for you, but I'd rather validate that idea, make sure that I'm, I'm correct in my thinking. So I did no research. I want you to do research. And I would start with your free content. Do the 20, find the 20% of your free content that's just got 80% of the love and the reviews and the comments and the feedback and the shares. Then you'll kind of know what kind of topics to build a course on and the research deeper from there. Number two, I didn't launch strategically. I just put out the videos, sent out a couple of emails uh, and just put the sales page up and it was open forever. You got to do a lot more than that. You got to pre-launch build up. You got to get them hyped weeks before this thing launches, at least at least two weeks before minimum. Uh, I need to have at least an email every day of the launch. So I'm talking with them every day and just touching base with them every day, pointing them to another benefit of the product, answering their questions about the product, getting them excited because it's a big deal. And then three, have some element of scarcity in that launch, some sense of urgency. The course is closing, so you got to buy now or it's you can't buy or the price is going up after this launch week or this bonus, this amazing bonus is going away. I've used all three successfully. The one that does the most money typically is when you close the course, um, but all three will work. And the third mistake I made was I didn't follow up with my students. I just, hey, I'm glad I got my money and I'm glad they got the course. I'm going to move on to bigger and better things. And I missed a huge opportunity to improve my product and figure out what products they wanted in the future. It took me a lot of guesswork. I just continued on this path of just building whatever I wanted. I built, that was my first course, and then I built one on vocals uh, a few months later that did okay, and then I built one on guitar, I built one on drums. These were all logical, I guess. None of them sold that well. It wasn't until my fifth and sixth courses when I finally built what people were asking me to build that my business went into a six-figure mark, <clears throat> and that changed, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the face of my business. It took it took me 2010, it took me a year and a half to get around to that. I launched four courses in the first year and a half before I finally launched course five and six that were truly the the winners. And uh, those courses have done over a million dollars. Um, one of them's done over a million dollars by itself. And it, you know, it just I'm a slow learner, so don't make that mistake. I could have figured that out if I just done some follow up research with my paid students. Now I want to give you a gift. I promise you something at the beginning. To build online courses, um, this is what I've been doing for a decade. And so what I want to do is help you even further. We've talked about a lot of the mistakes I've made, but I want to give you a step-by-step -step checklist and a plan for building a course that can do six figures or more, which is not hard to do over time, but I want you to build a winner, something that's a perennial favorite that's just going to continue to sell and put money in your pocket. So I've put together what I call the six-figure online course checklist. And this checklist is a simple PDF you can download right now and, and read. And I walk through four steps to building a course that does six or seven figures for you. It's so easy. It's so chock full of good stuff. And what it does is simplify all the stuff you could possibly learn about building online courses and just put it into a streamlined, do this, do this. Have you done this? Have you considered this? checklist format. I want to give it to you absolutely free. To download it, to download it, excuse me, just go to sixfigurecourse.com. So that's the number six, sixfigurecourse.com. Download it, read it, and then when you're ready to build your next course, reread it. When you're ready to build your next course, reread it. It'll just be a reference for you once you've launched a successful course. And your courses will hit six figures over time. Okay, so you may not be doing six figures yet, but 
like I said, my very first course, this one that I made all these stupid mistakes on, it started out as a $45 course. In 10 years, it's done over a quarter of a million dollars, right? So it's done multiple six figures and it's not my best seller and it's not my highest price. It's it's not, it's, it's a super niche, even in my own niche. It's not applicable to everybody. So if that kind of random non-research product can do multiple six figures over a decade, you can easily do six figures in a much shorter amount of time if you build a really, really good product. And this six-figure online course checklist will help you do it. So again, it's my gift to you for listening, for hanging out with me, and uh, for caring because you're still here. Obviously, this is relevant to you. So this is going to take it even deeper for you. And I think it's going to help you out. Again, it's free at Six Figure Course. That's the number six, sixfigurecourse.com. As always, thanks for hanging out with me. It means a ton. I've been blown away by the responses I'm getting on iTunes. I'm seeing a lot of you people in, in person. I'm the emails I'm getting, the DMs I'm getting on Instagram. Thanks for the support. Thanks for the support on this show. Thanks for the support of moving to the podcast format going a little bit longer format. Uh, I'm enjoying it selfishly, but what's most important is, is it helpful to you? And I've been hearing that that's a resounding yes. So thanks for telling me. Thanks for letting me know. It means a ton. I wish you the best of luck in your business this week. Got another episode coming for you next week. So stay tuned for that. As always, best of luck as you serve people, love on them, do what's best for them. And hey, it's messy. It's an ongoing process, but that's why I'm here to help you as your virtual business coach. If you need anything, give me an email, graham at grahamcochran.com. Until next time, my friend, have a great week. Bye.